All right, thank you everyone for coming and staying this long into the afternoon. And I want to separate it into kind of two parts. First, the emotional changes that occur, and then we'll delve more into the cognitive changes that occur. There are four main emotional changes I want to delve into today. There are more, of course, but unfortunately we don't have a week to talk about all of these. So we're going to focus on these four, which are apathy, disinhibition, depression, and pseudobulbar affect. We'll talk about what each of those means and what we can do about each of them. The first one is apathy. And apathy simply means a state of indifference. You, but patients have a lack of interest, emotion, or enthusiasm. That can manifest in a wide variety of ways. A common way is less goal-directed behavior. That means that the patient doesn't have a lot of initiative to do things. They just don't want to go out of the house, don't want to go to the store, they just want to sit and just sit, not do much else. They also don't have a lot of perseverance. They might start a task, but then stop partway through and not care that they didn't finish. Another manifestation is less goal-directed cognition. What that means is there's kind of just less interest in taking care of themselves. They have less interest in their health, less interest in taking care of their finances and their hygiene, that kind of thing. There's also less emotional responsivity, and this is for both pleasurable and negative emotions. So they just don't experience a wide range of emotions all the time. There might be a very stressful, very upsetting event, and they could seem to care less. Or there could be a very pleasurable event, a grandchild's birthday, for example, and they don't want to go. I think it's very important to point out that apathy is not the same thing as depression. Certainly, many patients with depression do have apathy. <laughs> But a lot of apathetic uh, people are not depressed, and we'll talk about the difference in a little bit. Apathy is by far the most common emotional change in PSB. It affects probably 70 to 80 percent of all of you at some point in the course. It's also usually a very early feature of the disease. Sometimes it even starts before you recognize the motor changes. Management can be tricky. The most important thing is to kind of correct any sensory def deficits or modify the environment. What I mean by that is you need to increase the reward potential that a, a person has to complete a task. So if they have trouble seeing, be sure they have their eyeglasses near them. Be sure it's a well-lighted environment. They have trouble or use a magnifying glass. If they have trouble hearing, be sure that their ears are cleaned out, that they're wearing their hearing aids have clocks and calendars on the wall uh, to remind them of different activities, have a set routine of different exercises, have familiar faces around of family and friends, and pet therapy and art therapy can be very motivating as well. So all these small things just to make it a little bit easier for them to want to complete a task, increase that reward potential. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of great of pharmacological options for apathy. There's been a wide variety of different types of drugs that have been studied, but somewhat disappointing in terms of their results. Most of the scientific evidence um, for their use is in Alzheimer's disease, but there's a lot of crossover. Uh, different types of medicines used are different stimulant medicines, such as modafinil or armodafinil, which are provisional and nuvisual. Different dopamine agents, Cinemet, um, Requip, Mirapex, and different antidepressants. Even though, as I said, this is not depression and shouldn't be mistaken for that, um, sometimes antidepressants are used as well, though often not as good of a response as we would like to see. The next behavioral manifestation I want to talk about is disinhibition. And this can actually seem quite paradoxical to the apathy that um, a person may experience. And the same person can experience both. Disinhibition kind of means three things. One is kind of loss of those social norms. So they may urinate in public, disrobe in public, or have inability to inhibit those spontaneous reactions to say curse words or follow language when they might not have done that before, say um, incorrect, politically incorrect uh, statements. 
Another manifestation of disinhibition is impulsivity. And that can manifest it as what we call delight and tolerance. And that, what I mean by that is that you might be sitting down and want to get up and go somewhere, and your caregiver's there to help you just a few feet away, but yet you can't wait for them, and you gotta get up and go right now. Another manifestation is uh, compulsivity. That often manifests with change in eating patterns, but it can be of any compulsive, uh, of any object, shopping, gambling, uh, any of those kind of things. Management of disinhibition primarily uh, relies on um, paying attention to the environment. Is the patient trying to tell you something that they can't express otherwise? Are they disrobing because they're warm? Are they saying foul language because they're frustrated or stressed? Um, another way is to ignore it or to react with very calm reassurance. Distract the patient. Um, don't acknowledge it, but just take them out to another room or outside. It can be very disturbing to strangers and family who don't understand, so a lot of uh, family members and patients will have little cards on them that they'll pass to a waiter in a restaurant or something like that, just to let them know that, please don't take offense, this is a neurological condition. It's very important to remember to try not to reason with the patient. It, it may seem logical to you, um, but uh, unfortunately with this disease, when we talk to the talk about the cognitive aspects, they, uh, the reasoning ability is not always the greatest. The third uh, manifestation I'm going to talk about is depression. Depression itself is actually relatively uncommon in uh, PSB, but it's actually very common in CBD. It's usually, it is the most common manifestation in CBD, in fact, um, affecting about 75% of CDB, CBD uh, patients. And depression are those persistent feelings of sadness that are often accompanied by hopelessness and inadequacy. It's typically something that the patient themselves are aware of, although not always. And like I said, apathy and depression are not the same thing. Most depressed patients will be apathetic, but a lot of apathetic patients are in fact not depressed. Management um, rests with psychotherapy, finding a good therapist who understands neurological disorders and what you're going through and uh, how to cope, and just someone to, to vent with about what's going on. And then pharmacotherapy with a class of drugs called SSRIs or serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Those are medicines that help to boost serotonin in our brain, which is one of the most important chemicals involved uh, in uh, depression. Serotonin is actually made in uh, part of the brain uh, called the pons in the RAF nucleus, which is affected by the pathology of CBD, um, but not in um, PSB, which is why this is much more common in CBD than PSB. Some of the, the these typical medicines are Prozac, um, Lexapro, Citalopram, Celexa. The last uh, emotional change I'm going to talk about today is the pseudobulbar affect. And what that is, is emotional incontinence, or that kind of impulsive, involuntary laughing or crying. Typically it lasts just seconds to minutes. There may be a stimulus for it, but often um, it's an exaggerated response to that stimulus. They may see something funny on TV and start laughing, but then can't stop laughing. Or they may see something sad on a movie and start crying, but then can't stop crying. There also does not have to be a stimulus, or it can be an inappropriate reaction. Action. Something very sad is happening and you're laughing and you can't stop laughing. This is completely involuntary. The patient has no control over this. And it's not something they want to do. And, uh, and because of that, it can result in a lot of um, social discomfort. One of the best ways to help manage it is to look for any triggers. Uh, distract yourself um, from the, whatever that trigger might be. Uh, take slow deep breaths or try um, standing up if you were sitting down, sit, uh, sit down if you were standing up, change your body position. There is a, one medication on the market that's FDA approved for this uh, condition, by, uh, goes by a brand name New Dexta. It's a combination pill of dextromethorphan and quinidine. Dextromethorphan is actually one, a common ingredient in cough syrup and quinidine is found in tonic water. Um, it's um, relatively safe unless you have certain cardiac uh, conditions and one of the more common side effects is uh, dizziness or nausea. 
All right, so we're going to move on to some of the cognitive changes in PSB and CBD. And to do that, we have to understand what cognition is, which is not an easy thing to explain. It's a little bit nebulous. But a good definition of cognition that I like are the processes that are associated with perceiving, making sense of, and using information. In other words, it's our thinking processes. There are four, more, four main domains of cognition that we're going to talk about today. There are lots more, um, but again, we don't have all week. And these are the four main uh, domains that we find impaired in um, PSB and CBD, and they are memory, language, visual, spatial, and executive functioning. And I will talk more about uh, what each of these are as uh, we go on. But to understand cognition we have to, and how they're affected in PSB and CBD, we have to understand um, the different parts of the brain that are involved. Um, the brain as a whole, uh, on the outer rims and the cortex, is um, our cognitive, our thinking centers. And each part of the brain has its own responsibility for different uh, domains of cognition. The memory centers are in the hippocampi. Uh, which are in the uh, center deep parts kind of inside of your ears. On the left side that tends to deal with verbal memory, the right side tends to deal with spatial memory. This is a, a common area that's affected in Alzheimer's disease, but is much less affected in PSB and CBD. So memory loss tends to be less of a feature of these disorders, uh, but can manifest due to other cognitive impairments we're going to talk about. The language centers in the brain are kind of on the uh, outer edge on the left side in the temporal and parietal regions. Some patients with uh, CBD who have primarily their left side affected, they'll have a lot of language problems. Conversely, on the opposite side, but a little bit more superior, are the visual spatial regions in the brain. So the patients with uh, CBD who have uh, primarily right side affected in their brain may have more visual spatial than language problems. And lastly, executive functioning, and that's right in the front of our brain, right behind our forehead on both sides. And this is the primary manifestation of PSB. And we'll talk more about what executive functioning actually means in just a bit. Now, we all know as we get older, we don't think quite as well. And there are some changes that are a normal part of aging. The slide's a little bit busy, but this is um, some data taken from a study in Seattle. It's one of the longest running uh, studies on the longitudinal effects of aging. And this first area here, uh, the first box shows that and patients who are uh, younger compared to patients who are a little bit older and how our cognition declines as we get older, we have a peak kind of around age 55. Verbal um, abilities and um, numeric abilities remain relatively um, stable over time, but all the other aspects of cognition actually tend to decline beginning around age 55. The second box, though, shows among the same individuals um, who are studied over seven years, so this is a person's own data compared to the, against themselves over time, that again, they would tend to peak around age 55, and by about age 74, pretty much everyone has experienced some decline uh, in all areas of cognition. Um, they begin to decline around 55 as the peak, with the exception of perceptual speed that begins declining in our 20s, actually. Now, the reason for the difference between these cross-sectional and longitudinal data is that there's so much uh, variability between individuals. Um, and some individuals are what we call super-agers, that, meaning that they experience little decline over time, and other people experience more decline. Um, and we have to think about why those are and what we can do to help uh, save our uh, memory and thinking abilities over time. Um, and it's going to come up again because the same kind of strategies in aging we use in uh, diseases like PSB and CBD. Now among those healthy individuals, as we age, there are a lot of different changes that occur. They occur in the neurotransmitters, the chemicals in our brain that the brain uses to talk to different parts. The size of the brain uh, changes. In particular, some uh, areas uh, change more than others. And then the networks, or the different connections between the different parts of the brain uh, change as well. And we have to reinforce those connections that are changing in order to help preserve our uh, memory. 
But this is all about healthy individuals, and we're here today um, to talk about PSB and CBD. And so there are even more changes that occur in the brain in PSB and CBD. So I'm going to focus on PSB first. And we can see just on looking at on MRIs of uh, patients with PSB, the different um, changes that are occurring. This is a um, picture of a um, cut lengthwise. And this is the brain stem right here. This down here is where the head is attaching to the neck. So the spinal cord right here comes up and becomes the brain stem. This is the pons part of the brain stem. And this upper part is called the midbrain. And this is primarily affected in PSB. Uh, so that it thins out over time and it gets what we call the hummingbird appearance due to that thinning particularly in this um, part right here this down here is a um, cross-sectional view of the same part showing up here so this is the midbrain right here and it becomes thin particularly in these areas right here and has this mickey mouse appearance and these are very good signs when we take pictures of your brain that we have the right diagnosis. Um, not present in everyone, but when it's present, it's very helpful. Now, this part of the brain is actually mostly involved in motor control, less involved in cognitive changes. But it's actually very, even though it seemingly is involved in motor changes, it actually is very important in cognition because it sends a lot of projections up to the front part of the brain. And as I had mentioned, the executive functioning, which is part of the front part of the brain, is what's primarily affected in PSB. And it's these connections from down here in the brain stem um, that are not functioning right. And we can see this when we take a look at the brain in a different way. This is a, a scan of a, a patient's brain with PSB. Um, looking at the metabolism in the brain. It's called a PET scan. So the patient is given an infusion of a radioactive glucose molecule. And the brain uses that uh, glucose, the sugar, for energy. And if parts of the brain aren't working very well, it's not going to be able to use um, that sugar for energy. And we can pick up on those patterns of um, what parts of the brain aren't working well. So on this particular image, black and blue is good, meaning it's using um, energy metabolism very effectively. Green is moderate, and then orange and red are bad, meaning it's really in a, not using energy and really not functioning well. And we can see this is a, a view of the brain from the right side and a view of the brain um, from the left side. And then this is cut, uh, this is the outside views, and this is cut in the middle. And this is from the front, the back, the top, and the bottom. And we can see it's these front parts of the brain that look different than the rest part of, of the brain. And those front parts of the brain are what's very important in executive functioning, are those projections from the midbrain that are coming up um, and telling how the, uh, the brain what to do. Now it's also green, meaning it's relatively um, mild to moderate. So the, I mentioned I would tell you exactly what executive functioning is. So I'll delve a little bit more into that with the cognitive changes that occur in PSB. A very, now, not everyone with PSB um, develops cognitive changes, but it affects probably 80% or so of us, roughly. Um, a common manifestation is cognitive slowing with those slow reaction times. The more complex a task, the slower the response is going to be. So you may ask your uh, loved one a question, and then they just don't seem to answer. Or you're in a conversation with your loved one and another uh, person, and they jump back in two, two steps behind, or they aren't able to keep track of that conversation. They just can't process it uh, very quickly and uh, seem to have these non sequiturs. Now, executive dysfunction is a bit of a nebulous term, and it means a lot of different things. And this is the main manifestation of cognitive impairment in PSB. It manifests with problem solving. And what we mean by that is the ability to organize, plan, and sequence tasks appropriately. So it's things like being able to go to the grocery store with a list, get all the things on the list, check out at the counter, get back home, put them away and do all those things in the appropriate order. Or it's things like being able to follow a recipe of I need to do this first, then that, and then the next step, and so on. 
It might be something like trying to fix the TV, uh, where you have to do one thing before you can do the next. Set shifting is a little bit different. That means someone's ability to multitask, or you can do one task, set it down, do another task, and then go back to that previous task, or do more than one thing at once. Conversely, it can also mean the ability to um, stay focused on a task without being distracted by the environment. So you're working on something in, in the tool shed, you hear the dog barking outside, you go and check on the dog, and then you completely forgot that you were doing something in the tool shed and had no idea you should be going back to that. Another manifestation is what we call abstract reasoning, and that's the ability to get the gist of a scenario or see the overall picture. And this can manifest with difficulty uh, with impaired judgment because you just, in a, in a variety of ways, you can't quite get that overall picture or you can't choose from multiple different options. It also can mean that you have difficulty um, understanding jokes or puns because they um, require um, abstract reasoning. Now, cognitive flexibility is also another common manifestation, and by that, it's actually cognitive inflexibility. Uh, patients like yourselves with PSB, you may find that you really like your routines. And when things get out of routine, you have a very hard time adjusting to that and making um, uh, the, those right kind of adjustments. Um, so having a good schedule is very important. Now, as I said, memory trouble actually tends to be mild in PSB. But when you're having trouble multitasking, maintaining your attention on the task at hand, it can seem like your memory is not that good, actually. Um, it's just a different type of uh, memory, what we call working memory, as opposed to um, memory about who you are um, or, or what you did last week kind of thing. Okay, so we're going to move on to cortical basal uh, syndrome. And cortical basal syndrome is a little bit different in that it tends to uh, affect one side of the brain over the other. And in this picture of an MRI, if someone um, cut along their face, uh, this is uh, right brain, left brain. And we see that there's a lot of black between the folds in the brain, meaning that there's fluid between those folds because it, they're very thin. And we see this when we look from top down, that particularly in this back part of the brain called the parietal lobes, we see a lot more of the fluid between the folds in the brain because they've shrunk, they've thinned out, which is the parietal lobe is the primary, primary area affected in PSB, or I'm sorry, CBD, and it tends to prefer one side over the other, either right or left, depending on the patient. Again, we can look at this from a metabolic uh, perspective, in which case we see similar findings that in this particular um, person, that left parietal region of the brain is not very metabolically active the way it should. And in this patient, the right parietal area of the brain. Um, but when we look on the uh, left, it's almost normal. Okay. So some of the changes that can occur in CBS can be some of the uh, similar changes to what we see in PSB with the slowed reaction times and executive dysfunction we talked about. And those are changes that we call subcortical, which means that they lie below the outside edge of the brain. Our CV, uh, cortical basal tends to affect the cortex, which is that thin rim on the outside of the brain or the thinking part of the brain. And what it does, depending on what part of the brain it's affected, there are three main outcomes, and that is that the praxis, language, and visual spatial abilities are affected. Now, praxis means the ability to program motor movements. That is affected in just about everyone with cortical basal syndrome. Um, and the original descriptions of cortical basal syndrome um, included this as a, a requirement for the diagnosis. There's only a very few handful of cases um, who have had an autopsy pathology consistent with cortical basal syndrome who didn't manifest jump problems in praxis during life. And like when I said it's the inability to program motor movements, it's things like um, not being able to imitate gestures like wave goodbye or blow a kiss, you know, not knowing how to coordinate the lips and to blow the air through the lips or how to bring the hand up and um, bend the wrist in order to wave. 
It can also manifest as trouble with dressing, with not knowing how to, a shirt goes on correctly, or how to use a, um, tools like a toothbrush or a butter knife. A person may pick up a butter knife on a table and look at it kind of strangely because they're not really sure what to do with it. They can also have language problems. And language problems can be a wide variety of things, from the ability to express yourself, to the ability to understand others, to um, the ability to find the right words. The grammar may be affected, where you say things out of order in a sentence. And the visual spatial abilities are knowing how to manipulate uh, items in the environment. It can manifest in a wide variety of ways of uh, knowing um, where you are in relation to objects in the environment, such as knowing that you are to the right or to the left of a chair, or knowing that no matter where you are in that environment, that the top of the chair remains the top of the chair. It can also mean uh, um, ability to see the whole picture in an environment, or you only see uh, bits and pieces of it. So if you see a word written on a page, you may only read part of the word. Or if you see a number like 1089, you may only see eight, because you only see part of that picture. It can also mean difficulty with reaching for objects that you clearly see. So if there's a pen on the table you want to pick up, you see that pen, but yet you can't reach for it and pick it up. So you're groping just kind of randomly on the table um, trying to pick up that pen. Now, this is all kind of doom and gloom, so is there anything we can do about this cognitive loss? Is it inevitable? To some degree, yes, unfortunately, but there are things we can do to help uh, restore and compensate. And so you need to take control, and those two main approaches are restoration and compensation. Restoration means the ability of making new brain cells, and the brain actually does have a remarkable ability to do this. There are two parts of the brain that can make new brain cells. There's the dentate, which is the area next to the hippocampus, which is the memory center in the brain. And then along the lining of the ventricles, which are the fluid-filled spaces in the center of the brain. And how do you tell your brain to make new cells? Well, you participate in new novel activities so that it wants to form new brain cells in order to help you accomplish that task. You exercise and you train your brain. Exercise helps to um, stimulate a new blood vessel uh, uh, formation in the brain, which improves the oxygenation and the ability of the brain um, to get the right nutrients to those new cells. Um, so again, that exercise builds those blood vessels. And then um, you want to improve those uh, connections um, that are being made um, from the, those new cells um, by um, doing brain training, cognitive uh, activities, novel activities, so things that you haven't done before. And it doesn't have to be anything big. It can be things like a new puzzle, a new TV show, just one little small thing each day. So there's lots of great uh, um, scientific studies out there about aerobic exercise and how it improves cognition, and not only cognition, mood. It's a very great um, uh, treatment for uh, depression. Lots of these different studies out there. Now compensation is the other strategy in terms of, of improving on your brain that I talked about. And that means to use different memory tricks, ways of keeping organized, making lists, um, using different reminders to help you keep track of things. Different um, memory tricks are things like visual imagery. Um, using acronyms like HOMES for Great Lakes. HOMES is uh, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. Uh, chunk things together, like a phone number, chunk them into the area code, the first three digits, the last four digits, things like that. Or use a method of loci, or imagine um, things along a route. So now, how did your memory improvement class go last night? I don't know, I completely forgot about it. <laughs> anyway, so there are 10 practical tips I want to share with uh, everyone about uh, cognitive health. Number one, do something new every day. Novelty is very good for the brain. Like I said, it helps to stimulate the production of new brain cells. It sparks that exploration and learning. So that could be something like watch a new TV program or try a new recipe. Number two, take a walk in nature. There's actually a great study out of the University of Michigan how um, nature walks improved memory. And it also just helps the mind to unwind and alleviate stress. 
So I think that seems like a pretty nice walk to me. Um, this one too. Number three, uh, use post-it notes. Um, they're a good compository strategy, great for a quick reminder. Um, keep um, notes on the fridge where you're likely to go multiple times a day and see them. Uh, don't keep them in places where you don't spend a lot of time or you'll never see them and, and what good are they? Number four, do a crossword puzzle or other brain teaser. And those help to challenge your memory and language skills and just helps to flex those muscles in the brain. Just like when we sit around all day, our, our muscles and our body get weak, our brain does too. So we gotta keep it stimulated and challenged. Now there isn't any one particular puzzle or game that's better than another. It's the actual act of doing something, not the particular act that you're doing. Number five, use your non-dominant hand. Try and do this for just an hour or so. If you're right-handed, try and use your left hand for everything. It's, it's really very difficult, but it helps to sharpen um, those uh, neural pathways in your brain and promotes neuroplasticity. If you have a CBD, um, you probably are, are using the uh, good hand anyway, but try and put a mitt over that good hand and only use that bad hand to encourage the brain to help kind of work around those bad areas that aren't allowing you to use um, the good hand very well. So brush your teeth, unlock the door, wash the dishes, broom, things like that with your um, non-dominant hand. And it's very hard to do, so you often have to find things like mitts and other things to put on your good hand in order to stop yourself from using it. All right, number six, try mindfulness meditation. And that means to sit somewhere where you're quiet and comfortable, you focus on your breathing and you just purge your mind of all of the thoughts and stresses going on. Meditation has been well shown to help improve physical and mental well-being, and increases the positive emotions and decreases stress. Number seven, do dance, chai chi, other movement therapy. I understand this is a group of uh, people with PSB and CBD, and this is not easy. Uh, but it, we do know that um, blood flow, uh, increasing blood flow to the brain is very helpful to help uh, generate those new cells. And so it's not easy, but find things that you can do, whether it's water therapy, different exercises while you're sitting, um, different stationary uh, equipment. And just make it part of your routine. Number eight, have a conversation with a stranger. Now, if you're already disinhibited, this may be pretty easy for you. Um, but if not, it, it really helps to uh, stimulate improvisation, that new novel activity I talked about, forming those new brain connections, and just increases your social contact, con which is very good for our overall mental health. <clears throat> Number nine, smile. Um, smiling itself can actually induce happy feelings. And there's that good old saying that, that laughter is the best medicine. And that has been shown to help increase blood flow. It improves the immune function, it reduces chronic pain and stress, and just overall improves your quality of life. And the last one, play video games. Um, there was a great study out of North Carolina State University that showed that um, older individuals playing games are more social. They are better adjusted and less depressed. Not only that, but it helps to improve your hand-eye coordination, reaction time, and visual acuity. So there's lots of great programs out there with um, Wii or Xbox. A few other practical uh, considerations. It's very helpful to have a good daily routine, particularly with PSV, where you might be a little inflexible cognitively. Have that set routine of, I'm gonna get up at this time, I'm gonna brush my teeth at this time, I'm gonna eat breakfast at this time, I'm gonna get dressed at this time. Even these um, small things that seem kind of minute are not so minute. Consider how you used to do things. It's, if you trying to change your bedtime from what has been your whole life, you're going to find that's not very practical and you're not going to like it. Also consider what time to usually function best. If 10 a.m. is a good time for you, where you tend to be at your best, then plan those a little bit more challenging activities such as going out of the home, going to the grocery store uh, for around those times. And one of the uh, most important things you can do is having regular uh, bed and wake up times. Help to set that circadian rhythm in the brain. Another important thing is to um, remember that we uh, patients with PSB and CBD um, can have very slow reaction times and have difficulty multitasking. So give just one instruction or do one task at a time. Don't say, take out the dog and then bring in the garbage cans. You're probably only going to remember to do one thing and then you and your caregiver are going to be kind of upset with each other. 
So break it down, um, break down each task into individual uh, tasks. <coughs> Remember to keep your environment clean, quiet, brightly lit, free of clutter, and give yourself enough time. Don't move quite, think quite as fast as you once did, and that's okay. Just be a little patient and allow yourself that kind of time. So the bottom line is to be active, find ways to stay engaged, do things you enjoy, and minimize your stress and stay relaxed. All things that sound great in theory. All right. I want to thank a couple of different people, um, Brad Bovee and Don Bowers, who provide a lot of the material for this, and of course all my patients who um, have greatly helped me and, and learn about all these great uh, disorders. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you so much. I know there are questions that people have in the audience, so please raise your hand and we'll come by with the microphone. Hi, thank you. Um, is there a connection between ADHD and PSP? Um, Yes, ADHD does tend to affect the front parts of the brain as well. Um, ADHD is probably a congenital disorder of executive function, meaning they're born with impaired executive function, whereas PSB is an acquired disorder of executive dysfunction. There are connections, absolutely. <laughs> ADHD? ADHD is attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Can you tell us something about how carbidopa levodopa can affect mood and cognition? Carbidopa levodopa, or the dopamine um, in it, is a very important neurotransmitter um, in the brain that helps to kind of just alert the brain. Um, and so it can particularly be probably most beneficial for the apathy part. Um, and um, people, if you're apathetic, it just helps to kind of stimulate or make you more alert. And that in itself can also improve cognition if you're more alert and paying attention to the environment around you and able to focus on just that one task. Another question that came up is, do some of the symptoms, some of the cognitive symptoms tend to worsen in the evening, like sundowning? Yes, absolutely, that can happen. Um, anytime we're stressed, tired, ill, it tends to be worse. And that, if you think about after you've had a busy day, um, been through a lot during that day in the evening, it tends to um, be worse. Or if you've had a change in environment, if you're hospitalized uh, for a period of time when you're in the hospital, you're probably not thinking quite as clearly for a number of reasons. There's a different environment, different medications, illnesses, things like that. Um, I have a question, um, and it, that may parallel which uh, the, the last question, but if a patient happens to have an injury of some sort, um, my husband had a, a neck injury, is there hope that that could possibly be rehabilitated or could, could you see that that might, would that possibly cause a step change? Uh, mm -hmm. Could you speak to that possibly? It, it can go both ways. Oftentimes, if there's an injury or an illness, one's cognitive abilities uh, do take a, a hit, at least temporarily. Um, as the illness uh, is rehabilitated, is treated upon, and the patient gets back to their usual routine, usual sleep habits, familiar environment, the cognition often gets better. Though in certain instances, particularly after major illnesses or surgeries, it doesn't go back to what it was um, prior to that injury. But there is a, an acute worsening in that um, first few days of the illness, um, then stabilizes and gets better as the illness gets better. One more thing. My husband potentially may have to have nasal septum surgery, mm -hmm. so because he has a lot of trouble clearing his nose himself, I have to actually do that for him now. 
and I was just curious. We have it. We have the surgery rescheduled like three times, so I was concerned about um, they they're putting him in the hospital. Mm -hmm. if he decides to do it to keep him under because of the anesthesia and the brain. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to anything about uh, anest being under anesthesia? Do you have any idea how that could affect yeah. a patient with CBD? And as the anesthesia itself, we does do a lot of different chemical changes to the brain. We don't know exactly how that plays into a different neurodegenerative disorders um, like PSB or CBD. It's a very difficult to sort out all these factors of the traumatic experience of being in the hospital, that unfamiliar environment, new medications. Um, but the more things that, that add up, um, the harder it is for the, that individual to cope um, with what's going on. Um, but it's a, it's a matter of weighing those risks and benefits and improving quality of life. If the surgery is really going to help him feel better and be more comfortable, we, we often may recommend it just because um, our quality of life is probably the most important thing. I see a hand back there. So the question was, um, her loved one um, gets the periods of very uh, restless where he can't sit still, is taking off blankets, things like that, and then has other periods where he's much more listless and she wants to know, is there anything you can do? Um, the most important thing is pay attention to the environment and when he is restless like that. Um, are there different people around? Is it always, is it a behavior where he's trying to get attention of one particular caregiver or he's stressed because there's people he doesn't recognize? Is he hot? Is he, does he need a change in clothes or need to go to the restroom? Sometimes there just isn't a reason for it. Another important thing to pay attention to are medications. Some of the medications, particularly the dopamine um, agents like carbidopa, levodopa, ropinirole, um, things like that can cause uh, what we call akathisia, which means that kind of restlessness. So if you know, try and pay attention to the timing of administration of any of those medications. But beyond that, unfortunately, there isn't that's a common symptom um, and that kind of play between the disinhibition and the apathy that a lot of patients experience that seem to be relatively paradoxical. Um, Mm -hmm. So it would be a great thing to bring up to your doctor that it may be a sign that he's underdosed or overdosed or whatever on medication. Um, you know, I want to ask about, uh, I don't know if everybody has this, but when there's a lot of saliva in the throat, mm -hmm. and um, what I was told is I was looking at the suction pumps, but they said the more you use a suction pump, the faster the saliva will come back. So just do it manually, and they have these things, they just look like little lollipops, and they have like a, a pink sponge on the end, and you swab the back of the throat, because the saliva gets to be very thick, like it's kind of like bubble gum, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is just something I'm saying, because I'm doing this recently, and the other thing I wanted to follow up on is what the lady said about the darkness. I swear, I mean, it's only been the last six to 12 months, I noticed my wife is much more restless in the evening. Once it gets dark, I mean, she doesn't have Alzheimer's, she has PSP, mm -hmm. but she gets very irritable all night long. She, you know, she's making noises and sounds and, you know, she just is irritable. And then as soon as the sun comes up in the morning, she's peaceful and calm like a little mm -hmm. lamb when I'm trying to get her up for a shot. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you know, you know, people said, well, what about a sleeping pill, you know? But I don't know. Uh, What's your recommendation on that? Um, I, I try to avoid sleeping pills the best I can. Most sleeping pills are very bad on our memory and our thinking abilities and can worsen those and, and make you more confused and unfortunately even sometimes hallucinate. Now a lot of diseases like PSB and CBD do affect our circadian rhythm where we change the uh, times that we would normally go to bed or wake up. And it's trying to retrain the brain into what a popular, proper circadian rhythm is. And so having those set routines when they uh, of a, only go to bed at the same time every night and when you go to bed 
you don't eat too close to bedtime, it's quiet, it's dark in the room, you're not watching TV in the room, and then you're getting up at the same time every day. Taking melatonin, um, a half hour to an hour before bedtime can be helpful as well. Melatonin is a, a natural chemical in the brain that is the primary chemical responsible uh, for regulating our circadian rhythm. It's a supplement available over the counter at most uh, drugstores. Okay, we have time for one more question. I forgot to say something more. It's one about the darkness. Only in about the last maybe month, that, you know, we were doing this for years, and the, it's only been that darkness and irritability the last year or two maybe. Uh, a lady told me this, and I did it, and it helped. Not perfect, but a lot better to put all the lights on in the room. Mm -hmm. I mean, I put a mask over her eyes, you know, mm -hmm. but it seems kind of silly to put the lights on and put a mask on. But when she knows there's light, light, she's calmer. I, I remember, you know, like I said, when I, I get her up in the morning, as soon as the sun comes up, peaceful. Just, yeah. you know. A lot of um, uh, patients with the brain diseases, PSB, CBD, Alzheimer's disease, do prefer lighted environments. Dark environments are very disconcerting. Um, we think, you know, watching a scary movie is always a dark environment. Um, so keeping things well lit can actually be very helpful to manage different behavioral manifestations, even if it is nighttime, um, uh, but if they're having difficulty at night. And I think that's great that you paid attention to what was working for you and um, it's, it's paying attention to those little things um, that can make a difference. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wicklund, for your presentation.